I'm no good at taking good advice And I'm self-careless, so don't tell me twice That lately I've been so stuck in my head That I forget just about everything my therapist said Maybe I'm self-helpless Maybe I'm self-helpless Maybe I'm self-helpless Maybe we are all self-helpless Hey everyone, welcome to the Self-Helpless Podcast. I'm Delaney Fisher, and today I'm chatting with Anna Aslanian, who is a licensed therapist and founder of My Therapy Corner. And we are discussing jealousy, specifically jealousy in relationships. And today is a helpster's choice topic. So thank you to everyone who voted over on our Patreon. Um, if you'd like to submit topics, vote on topics, submit guests, all that good stuff, you can ho- head over to patreon.com slash selfhelpless. Um, so yeah, today, this is such an interesting, um, this is just such a juicy topic inherently, right? Like this, this emotion of jealousy really has such a bad rap. When you think about the range of emotions we experience, we usually don't feel like a bad person or, you know, we don't feel like a bad person for feeling sad or fear or disgust or, you know, anything like that. But when we feel jealousy, we like to shut it down, avoid it and often aren't even honest about experiencing it. Why? Why is it that this emotion has been deemed like the bad one? Uh, and what what if we treat it like the other ones that we have? Like, you know, when we're sad, maybe we need a good cry or a nap. When we're anxious, maybe we need to take some deep breaths. When we're jealous, maybe we can just be curious about why we're jealous and tell ourselves it's okay to feel that that emotion. Like having this uncomfortable feeling doesn't just make you an asshole, right? Um, I know that in my current life, I I now love using jealousy as a tool to learn something about myself, um, kind of as like a, a compass of where I might want to go next. Um, and when it comes up, I just, I like to ask myself, why am I experiencing this? You know, what part of this thing or situation or whatever it is that I'm jealous about, what part of it do I want for myself and why? And not only why, but am I willing to do the work to get that thing if it's a particular outcome? Um, And, you know, sometimes I'm like, yeah, I do want that. And I am willing to put the work into whatever that is. And sometimes I'm like, I think I just am kind of jealous of the outcome of this thing, but I don't actually want to do the work that it takes to get there or do that or whatever it might be. So sometimes it it tells me, hey, you want this thing that you maybe weren't aware of. And I take a little baby step towards it. And sometimes I just have to let, try to let it go because I don't actually want, want it. I want the shiny object maybe at the end of a certain process or something. And, um, I, I think I'm just not as afraid or ashamed of this emotion as I was when I was younger. Like, oh my gosh, in my early 20s, I really wish I was more aware of what this emotion was trying to tell me because I think it would have saved me a lot of frustration and confusion about what I wanted my life to look like. Like, for example, I remember during the several years that I was a performer, I remember being on stage and looking out at the audience and feeling jealous of them. But I didn't know I was feeling jealousy at that time. I just felt kind of sad after shows and I didn't really know why um, because I was on autopilot for so long that it just didn't, it didn't even register that I should ask myself how I'm feeling or why or do I like what I'm doing or you know where all of this is leading. But now I can look back and, and actually understand that I was experiencing jealousy. I was jealous of these people who were out enjoying their time, enjoying their life, doing something fun just to do it. They were with their friends, with family, they were with their partners, having a good time. And I was alone on Friday or Saturday night working, feeling kind of empty after getting off stage and not really knowing why. And if I was more aware back then, I could have made the connection of, huh, maybe Maybe I want to make more time for fun, or maybe I actually want to be with my friends right now or my family. Maybe I want to be on a date. Maybe I want a significant other, you know? Maybe I want a more serious relationship than what I've been doing. Um, And 
yeah, like maybe it would have kind of told me a little bit earlier, like, hey, I don't think this is how you really want to be spending your time and your weekends. And you might need to figure out a different approach to this, uh, you know, the, the enjoyment that you do have from this thing. So I don't know, it can be so hard to like snap ourselves out of autopilot and ask ourselves these, these tough questions, especially when you have like this icky feeling of, of jealousy, but it can really be just a great tool. At least that, that's what I have found for myself. Um, I also remember meeting someone several years ago, and this is when I really hated my day job. And I met someone who was able to work from home, make their own schedule. They had built a business for themselves that was creative, all these really cool things. And I remember just kind of feeling bad around the person, <laughs> this person. And I didn't really know why, but I, I kind of wanted to avoid them. Now I look back and realize, oh my gosh, I, I at the time wanted to be able to work from home and make my own schedule and do something creative. And instead of seeing that person as inspiration, you know, for me, or even a connection or a friend that I could have had and could have really learned a lot from and asked them questions and gotten advice from, um, it was just so much easier to write it off and be kind of like, eh, you know, we probably don't have anything in common because they're just really lucky and my life feels like shit. Um, so that was a, that's a big lesson, uh, in hindsight now that I just did not realize at like, I don't know what I was, 24 year old Delaney. Um, and it makes me wonder how often are we doing this to ourselves? Like where we're actually avoiding people or situations because being around it or that the person forces us to really look at ourselves and our own lives. And look, I'm not saying that like, this is always the case. Sometimes somebody just really sucks to be around and that's that it's not like it's always your own jealousy blocking you but i really wish i could tell my younger self like hey dude pay attention and like wake the fuck up because you might be sabotaging yourself and not even realizing it and you might be avoiding certain situations or people that maybe make you feel a little bit insecure or uncomfortable but when you take a moment um they're actually, it's actually, they're, there's, they're not doing anything wrong and, and they're a lovely person and you just feel like crap. So anyway, um, if you are feeling jealousy right now, I would really try to look at it as a, a positive thing if you can, because it's giving you some hints on what you might want that you don't maybe yet have, or that you're working towards, or that you want to work towards. And uh, I know it can feel kind of gross, but um, so in this discussion with Anna, we are chatting about the root cause of jealousy, the difference between jealousy and envy, how it can show up in relationships, what we learn from it. And I think just one of the most important parts of all this is normalizing this emotion. So here is my conversation with Anna. So can we just start off with what is jealousy and what is the difference between jealousy and envy? Mm -hmm. Good question. Um, so, you know, people define it differently. Um, and to be honest, I don't like any of the definitions out there. Um, maybe because I, I feel like it's, um, it's a negative word, right? Like people feel shame when they feel jealousy. Yeah. They feel it's a bad feeling. Um, they shouldn't feel jealousy. Um, and envy as well. But there's a difference between envy and jealousy, you know? So jealousy tends to be more relational, um, when uh, someone uh, is maybe uh, the relationship that you're valuing and you love is threatened and some might take it away. Right. Whereas with envy, um, someone out there is um, has or is doing or is saying something that you would want to have yourself. So it's usually a quality or uh, a behavior that is missing in you that you really want to also have in your life. So I might be envious that someone, I don't know, out there is um, singing and dancing. And let's say I really wanted to do that, but I'm shy, right? So I'm like, oh, I wish I could also go out there and, you know, do this karaoke. Right. Um, versus with jealousy, you know, maybe the person that I am in love with is um, giving attention to another woman and I start comparing myself and in my head, they are better looking and smarter and I just start feeling jealous. 
Okay. Gotcha. So is the main difference, like you mentioned re relational, like could somebody feel envy towards somebody that they know personally, or is that usually some, like a stranger? And then same thing for jealousy. Can somebody be jealous of somebody they've never met, or is that always somebody that they know? Yeah, I mean, you can't feel envious of anybody, you know, a close friend, a family member, a stranger, right? Uh, someone you've never ever met. Okay. Um, absolutely. And with jealousy, too, it tends to be more um, in in personal relationships when it comes to jealousy, uh, because I, you know, this relationship or um, uh, is at stake, right? I might lose it or um, it's somehow threatened. So it, that tends right. to be more intimate relationships, whether it's friendships or romantic relationships, but they're more intimate in nature. Okay, gotcha. And is there is there a type of envy too where somebody might feel like maybe they don't necessarily want something, but they don't think the other person should have it. Is that still envy or is that something else like completely? Yeah, I think it's still envy, envy right? With a little bit of, usually when people have that, there is a sense of judgment and yeah. a sense of maybe fairness of this person is not worthy to have X, Y, and Z, right? Um, it's not fair. That usually what comes up, uh, but it's still under the envy category, right? You're still, and usually with all of this, it says more about you than the other person. They are the mean to what's actually happening internally with you. And right. we'll, we'll get to that, but yeah. Right, yeah, it is, it is really interesting how feeling envy or, or uh, of somebody that you've never even met, they have no idea that you're experiencing that emotion. So, it, you know, it is all about you. Like you've never even met the person and they're bringing something up in you mm -hmm. that you need to kind of tend to. You mentioned yeah. that we feel so much shame around jealousy and, and envy and all of that stuff, but what, why does this jealousy emotion feel so icky? I mean, we experience a range of emotions, sadness, apathy, whatever. Why does this one feel like just, I don't know, so gross compared to the others? <laughs> I feel like it hasn't been normalized, you know, in our society. Yeah. yeah. Many negative labels. You're the jealous girlfriend or, um, you know, this person is envious. So that means you're going to like somehow sabotage or you don't wish well for others. Um, so there's a lot of negative uh, meanings around the word jealousy and envy as well. Um, and who, and we don't want to be bad, right? We don't want to um, be labeled as bad. And I think that's probably where it comes from, that people don't want to feel jealousy. And sometimes there is um, so much judgment and shame when that comes up. Like if you're feeling envious and, and jealous, then something is wrong with me. And people don't want to admit oftentimes in their relationships that they are feeling jealous. Yeah. Uh, that would mean then they're, also feeling insecure and that would mean they need to be vulnerable and that's that's a tough situation to be in most of us aren't comfortable with vulnerability like that yeah oh absolutely I, t I totally agree like there's this whole like you know we're so focused in our society of like be a good person you know be good like wh what does that even mean like we <laughs> we have an ex we have a range of experiences and emotions and and feelings I'm curious to get your perspective on what is like the root cause of this feeling? I mean, like, yes, you know, if somebody's feeling jealous, they might be insecure, they might be scared about losing the relationship. But what is even deeper than that? Is it like rooted in we need we needed jealousy, this feeling to come up in, in order to survive at some point? Did it tell us that we needed, I don't know, uh, more resources or something like that? What's going on at the very root cause of it? Yeah, so I usually I kind of um, experience that with clients and with people just in my life and myself. Um, there are two possible, you know, options here. And through exploration, you can kind of determine which one fits for you in your case. Sometimes, you know, jealousy can show up in relationships where, let's say, you know, one partner is entrusting their partner's friend um, they, they're thinking there might be something there or there's maybe attraction or um, they're jealous if their partner gives even just conversational attention to somebody else yeah. um, and they're not comfortable with it. So 
sometimes there is some truth to it, right? And I think jealousy is a call for us to look within us and see what's going on, what, what, which ones of our needs aren't being met. That's how I look at jealousy. Mm -hmm. And in that case, sometimes when you actually sit down and talk to these people and explore what's actually happening, oftentimes it's not, um, you know, out of nowhere. It actually is based on real situations that would make anybody feel threatened, right? right? So then it becomes... Um, can you set healthy boundaries? For example, your partner might not be cheating on you, depending on how you define cheating, right? They might not be actually having an affair, but perhaps they're really flirtatious with other people, right? Mm -hmm. And maybe they are telling um, somebody else personal things about you and about their lives that you're like, wait, but this doesn't feel good. You're supposed to be sharing those personal intimate things with me since I'm your partner, but then you have this coworker friend, let's say, and you're sharing all sorts of intimate details about your life with this person, right? right? There's something going on there, right? And uh, then that will be, you know, causing some conflict where we're like, we're not, doing, we're just friends. There's nothing going on. You're paranoid. You're insecure. Why are you being jealous for no reason, right? So I think it's important to look at what am I jealous about? What are the behaviors that I'm uncomfortable with? Because it could be that the person is just violating your boundaries somehow, you know, right. and, and crossing some boundaries that shouldn't be crossed. And you're just unsure if you can stand up for yourself and say, well, wait a minute, I'm actually not comfortable with this kind of friendships, right? right? I'm not comfortable with you flirting with others in front of me, or I'm not comfortable with you commenting in, uh, on other, let's say, women's photos on Instagram and, and saying how hot they look. I don't know, right? Like there's right, all right. these examples. And that's a boundary thing. And it's and it's very much, um, uh, it makes sense why someone would feel uncomfortable, you know? And there are, you know, I also want to normalize there's all sorts of relationships out there, you know, open relationships, relationships where like both partners are comfortable with that. Uh, and they flirt with other people and some that are very, you know, strict, so to say, with, you know, what is allowed and mm -hmm. all of it is normal as long as both partners are on the same page, right. right? So if we're not on the same page and something is not sitting well with me, I think it's important not to ignore your own feelings and not to tell yourself, again, that shame comes up, right? And then we go, well, like, oh, I'm just jealous and insecure. Yeah. My partner isn't doing anything wrong. It's all me right? Don't go right. there. Think, what is actually your partner doing? Is that making you feel uncomfortable, right? Is there maybe some, some truth to what behaviors need to be altered a little bit, right? Um, right. So there's that one scenario that can happen. Um, other times, you know, it can be based on our past experiences of, um, you know, some small or big traumas that have happened or what we have witnessed growing up. And, you um, so, so de depending on what it is, uh, it can be a different situation, but regardless, it's, there's usually some kind of trauma and people get really freaked out when I use this word because people have different feelings about what trauma is and it, it's sure. not yeah. it's just simplified, right? Like something happens or something should have happened that doesn't, right? And we make meaning out of it. And sometimes that meaning is painful. Um, and so that can alter how we view the world, how we view ourselves, right? So let's say if you grew up in a family where your uh, one of your parents had affairs and was was um, disrespectful to, let's say, your mom or your dad, right? Um, you that's what you grew up watching about relationships and about trust and about jealousy, right? So then your foundation of relationships is that you can't trust your partner to have friends because they are going to cheat or they're going to do something wrong. Right, maybe right. It's your, if it's your relationship, maybe you have been cheated on before. Maybe you have been with someone who lied to you, who um, had emotional affairs. They also matter, right? It's not just the physical act. There's all sorts of affairs that can happen, all sorts of betrayals. And so sometimes your partner might be wonderful, but you might still be carrying on this pain, these wounds from the past. Right. So you right. might see that something is happening when there's nothing happening. Right. It's because you, your, um, you know, your psyche, your organism, your mind, your body, all parts of you are truly trying to protect you from that happening again. So you're like, wait, you have a female friend. Oh, last time I had this experience of a female friend it didn't end well. So I'm on alert already. Right? Yeah. But yeah. It can be 
either one of those stories, right? But no matter how we look at it, the answer relies within you to go back into yourself and go, okay, is this really um, a situation where I need to ask for better boundaries and practice setting them and assert myself, maybe leave the relationship if they're disrespecting me like that, right? Um, sometimes it's just about a conversation of like, hey, I'm uncomfortable when this happens. Can we set some rules about what's acceptable when we're out in public and what's not, right? Don't flirt with waitresses. Mm -hmm. either. Mm -hmm. And that's what you find. Sometimes they're like, oh, I didn't realize it bothered you. Okay, yeah, right? And sometimes, no, you need to leave the relationship. Um, or is it something that is from my past that I really need to heal? Right. So what if somebody's having a really hard time? They don't know if the jealousy that's coming up is because somebody is crossing their boundary and they have to deal with that, or it's unresolved trauma and they have to deal with that. What if they're feeling really murky about it and they're not really sure, like, is this me? Is this them? It's a, is it a combination? How can they, how can they get a little bit more clarity around that, whether they're experiencing jealousy in a romantic relationship, friendship or otherwise? Yeah, that's such a good question. And that happen, happens so often. Um, I think therapy is a really good way to explore that because it can be either or it can be both. Right. Yeah. That's what happens where you um you have had those uh traumatic relationship experiences in the past and your partner is is crossing some boundaries you're not comfortable with, but you've also learned that uh it's not safe to speak up for yourself or that um you don't trust your own intuition and your own knowing. And so you're thinking for uh to look at somebody else to tell you if you're if it's okay to feel how you're feeling. That happens right. so right? Like that's when you'll see people telling their friends, like, oh, she or he or they're doing this, you know, am I is it okay that I'm feeling jealous? Would you feel jealous? Is it um it's almost like asking for permission. Right. Right. Instead of Feelings are always valid. You feel what you feel. It is what it is. If you're feeling jealous, you're feeling jealous. That's okay. Let's get curious about it with some self-compassion, not self-judgment. Yeah, no, absolutely. Is there, a, is there such a thing as healthy jealousy versus unhealthy jealousy? I know for myself, I've definitely experienced, like, for example, in a romantic relationship, somebody voiced that they felt a little bit jealous about my job because I spent a lot of time working and maybe not as much time with them. And I felt they were completely valid in that. I'm like, oh God, you're right. I need to give you more attention. And then on the other hand, I've been in uh, like more of a friendship that that person didn't like when I hung out with other people. And that felt controlling and not like coming from a, a compassionate place. So mm -hmm. what's healthy, what's not when it comes to uh, jealousy? When it's healthy, and this kind of can be generalized to a lot of different things, it's usually when it's it feels correct for you authentically, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's that's a hard thing to explain. But if so for the example with the example that you brought of um with the work, right? Mm -hmm. You can be a bit jealous of that as well. It's a really good example, right? Like I want to, I love you, I want to spend time with you. Uh, I value our time together. I look forward to it, but I'm noticing your job takes, you know, so much time where it's threatening this relationship that I have with you and my yeah. close my connection to you. Right. But you on the receiving end of that, right. You, you know, I think it's always good to hear our partner when they come with something and to really try to put ourselves in their shoes. And, and that's how we make sense of things, right? Okay. What is what they're saying makes sense at all. Right. Yeah. And, in this case, it made sense for you. You're like, okay, I can see that, right? Because they, what they're actually longing for here is time with me. It's some quality time with me. And right. I have been busy with work. And so it makes sense. Um, that felt healthy, right? Because the person came to you, they communicate their needs and what's happening and ask for what they want more, which is your time. Yeah. The other one, you know, um, is also an excellent example because you said it, it felt more controlling and manipulative. Mm -hmm. right um and not to say that the person who was doing that was aware of it a lot of times this is more subconscious yeah. uh, dynamics playing right where I am so threatened of um losing a relationship that I turn to manipulative tactics and control in order to keep it 
threats, mm-hmm. right? If you leave me, I'll harm myself. Or um, that's another example that can come up with people. Um, so I think when that was presented to you, it didn't feel authentic to you. You're like, well, something is off here. Right. This feel, right. So I think the way you find out if it's healthy or unhealthy is how does it land with you, with your nervous system? Do you feel that it's, it makes sense and your organism is calm? Like, okay, I, I, that makes sense. I get it, right? Or does it feel uneasy, like this person trying to control you, manipulate you, that it, you know, um, it's unfunded or anything you know, that makes sense at all, because a lot of abusive relationships also have an unhealthy and toxic level of jealousy, where it's really, you you can't have any male or female friends, you, you can't talk to your family, right, they kind of isolate you, you're only mine, only mine, right, right. It's not healthy, right, right. yeah, Definitely. Yeah. It's interesting because when you on like the surface level, like if somebody is experiencing some jealousy, like, oh, I'm afraid that my friend is going to find other friends that they maybe enjoy spending more time with or whatever, than they do me or something. Okay. Like from, from a, I guess a surface level perspective, it's like, okay, so worst thing that can happen, you just find other friends that doesn't seem so threatening, but the reaction that comes up with people does feel very like can feel very severe. Is that because it's connected to like this hard wiring that we have as humans of like, we need connection, we need belonging. Maybe, you know, we obviously needed that for survival at one point and it's hitting that nerve of like, okay, if I lose my friend, then I'll be alone, then I won't survive. Like what, what is, what is going on with something that kind of seems like pretty minor to like the naked eye, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, the answer varies depending on the person, because I think while we have like a general understanding of what jealousy is or general behaviors of humans, we, yeah. we are each so uniquely ourselves with our experiences and our needs. But some examples are, you know, um, it could be that, you know, if something, if trauma happened in your past where it's not so much what happened, but it was neglect, meaning what should have happened that didn't, right? Like you said, we all are wired for connection, for sense of belonging. Um, all the kids, you know, growing up from birth on need to have that security of, I see you, I'm attuned to your needs, um, you matter. And unfortunately, many people don't have this, right? Um And some even with loving, kind parents don't have this because their parents had their own traumas and weren't able to show up for them for them the way they should have. Right. So then they're left with this big hole of need of that connection. Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's this huge hole that can't be just easily filled. Right. With that one friend or one partner. And so their need might be bigger than what would objectively be appropriate for a friendship right right right. like like, well if it doesn't work out you can have you have more than one friend to meet your different needs right but a lot of times people can just really um on some level expect one person to fulfill all their needs whether it's a friend or a partner Mm -hmm. right and that's coming from a very young place you know, and that's where like me might have heard of inner child work, trauma work, all of that attachment focus work. It right. all goes there because that's how kids are, right? They want all their attention like from their parent. My pe- they're supposed to need to meet all our needs: food, security, sleep, attention. You know, learning, exploring, connection, all those things. And sometimes that you know subconsciously stays with us, where we then almost like transfer and project those expectations onto other people in our lives right friends yeah and so when that threatens like no no don't go you can't go it's this huge reaction yeah it's really interesting how two different people could be coming at the the situation from you know completely different perspectives one person might be thinking what's the big deal? Just like get other friends, you know, and hang out with them also. And the other person could be like all these feelings of 
abandonment or trauma are coming up and they might not even be aware of it where like one person's like, oh, no big deal. And one person's like, I don't know if I'll make it through if you leave. Right. And it's just interesting how that can play out and it subconsciously a lot of the time. And um, you said a lot of times they have no idea, right? Right. right. Doing this on purpose. Like when people right. say you're clingy, you're too needy, you're controlling, you're manipulative that makes the person feel so so much shame like oh something is wrong with me you're the jealous type right um you have issues but really when you look from that trauma informed perspective all of it makes sense and we can get with compassion and there is so much healing available you know to to heal those younger parts um through therapy through self-healing and all of that uh, but people aren't aware of it. So I think it's important to also mention that most people don't do that on purpose yeah. uh, as the outliers and abusive relationships, but most people have experienced that and it's not, you know, uh, on purpose. Yeah, no, that totally makes sense. So I know that for me, when I was younger, I didn't, I wasn't as introspective. If I was feeling jealous about something, I just was, you know, I pushed it down like, oh, don't, don't think about it. That feels gross. Um, and now I really love using jealousy as a tool to learn more about myself and learn more about maybe what I want that wasn't as obvious before. So mm -hmm. what kind of things can jealousy, how can we use jealousy as a tool basically? Yeah, I think it's, you know, good to, um, pause I, and regardless of what you're working on, but especially with jealousy, um, we need to have self-compassion. You know, I always tell everybody who's trying to make any changes in their life, you can't grow and learn and heal if you're constantly being put down, right? Because then your nervous system goes into protective modes of like how to protect yourself instead of actually learning and growing. Right. Um, and so if you're constantly putting yourself down for feeling jealousy, oh, what's wrong with me? You know, I'm needy, I'm jealous then you're not really growing. So I think the first step is always, always to have self-compassion and realize that like most people at one point in their life, at many points in their life, feel this. It's a human experience that exists for a reason. So let's normalize it. It's okay that I feel this way. Mm -hmm. And then the second step would be to um, do some self-reflection, you know, and this can be really helpful to do with a therapist who can guide you with specific modalities or questions so that you can get there but also on your own um, what is it that I'm longing that I need is yeah. the question right because behind every um, complaint or criticism that um, we have there is usually a want and a need underneath that um, and I think kind of getting down to it okay if I'm jealous of this person's relationship with this friend like what is it that I actually want here oh I want to be close to this person again and have a connection mm -hmm. or I'm envious that this person is going out there and performing right and I find myself judging their performance and saying how horrible they are hmm, what is it actually that's bothering me here oh maybe there's a part of me that wants to be like them or to to do what they're doing Right. And I'm blocking my own path to towards that, right? right? So getting down to like, okay, there's the complaints, there's the criticism, there's things you don't like. Okay, what what's underneath all that? What is it that you actually are hoping for that you want and need? And yeah. that will hold, you know, the key to your healing because then you can explore depending on what the answer is, you know, what can I do to get that? What are the blocks preventing me from that? Right. It could be as simple as going to that person and saying, hey, I really miss you and I want to spend time with you. I know we haven't been spending much time together. I'm also feeling insecure and I'm telling myself you don't care about me when I notice you're spending more time with so and so. Right. Just a simple yeah. conversation for them to be aware, you know, and oftentimes on the receiving end, if you if you say it nicely, it's a very loving um connecting experience because they're like wow like you want to spend time with me like all this thing is about that you like me so much you want to be with me more right, right. it's right. a nice thing um you know and sometimes you know in case of like when there's envy about what someone is doing right um 
Can you look at what are the barriers preventing you from doing what you want and being who you want? Right. right? It's past. Is it um, situational? You know, and then that can kind of help you make a plan, right, of how to get to where you need to go. Um, instead of hating on somebody else or getting upset or judging. Um, so I think just that two steps can really help. Yeah. Let's say somebody's become aware that they they want something that somebody else has and they're ready to try to make it happen for themselves. What do they do first? A mm-hmm. um, few things, you know, um, I would start with what are the steps or the barriers preventing me from, from doing that? Mm-hmm. Cause that will be different for each person, right. you know, sometimes it can be situational. Um, you know, I don't have the funds. I don't have, um, the time I'm working long hours. Um, and sometimes it could be all internal, uh, blocks, right? I feel like I'm not good enough or I don't have this skill, right? Um, and then based on that, you know, what was the first step you can take? Can you learn that skill? Can you have this person be your role model, mm-hmm. right? Because in some ways that's great if there is someone that's already doing what you want to do, because then you can either if talk to them or if you're not comfortable, at least just kind of learn from what they're doing uh, and take similar steps. Um, I think therapy can be really good Um, avenue to explore this because the answers that I normally get are so different for each person right Um, sometimes it is a matter of okay I don't have a support system let's work on finding you the support system so you can get there sometimes it's I don't feel like I'm good enough okay where did you learn that as a new baby you weren't born thinking you're good enough right right well like learn through experiences so let's kind of unpack all that so that you don't have to carry that for the rest of your life um, you know, so it, the answer varies, but I think just doing that self-reflection and seeing what's, what's stopping me from living the life I want to live and being who I want to be speaking up for myself, whatever the situation may be. Right. Um, and then you can kind of take steps towards that. And it's, it's easier said than done, right? Like even in relationships, right? Sometimes my, through exploration, they might realize, you know what? Yeah. My partner is disrespecting me. I'm not making these things up. Like they are, you know, crossing the boundaries and they are not even remorseful about it. Right. And yet a lot of people will stay in those relationships out of fear of being alone or out of fear of, you know, different things. So um, it's not as easy. So I think having that safe space to talk about it and to um, unpack all the traumas of the past and, Um, and heal through it with some guidance can be really helpful. Are there any kind of subtle ways that jealousy can pop up that people would be surprised to learn, oh, it's actually jealousy that I'm experiencing? (laughs) Is there any behaviors that could be coming up from people that might actually be related to jealousy that they're experiencing and they don't even know? Avoidance, Mm -hmm. right? If you're avoiding being next to someone, um, and you, you then tell yourself it's because I don't have time or it's because we're different people. We won't click, you know, yeah. um, but maybe it's because they are a, a mirror reflecting to you what you want to have and you don't have. So right. you're in the presence of reminders of how in your mind you're lacking or you're not doing enough or you're not enough. Right. And it doesn't feel good. So really what you're avoiding is not that person, but what they represent and what they stir up in you, right? Right. The other thing is, uh, you know, when, and this is so common on social media, if you if you see like the comment sections, sometimes they're so negative, I'm like, oh, just so hard to read those. But when, when we speak badly about other people that we don't even know, mm-hmm. right? Or we just know very briefly, um, and all this hate, you know, all this judgment, um, where is that coming from? Right, where it's that urge to really say, I don't like this person because they're blah, 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 when you don't even know them. Right. And I think it often comes from, again, they might have something you want to have, or they're doing something you want to do, or they remind you of some kind of experience that you had that you didn't like or didn't sit well with you. Right. So there's no matter what it is, it goes back to you. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think those are the two examples that I would I would share about that. 
Yeah. It's so interesting that, you know, the person that you could be experiencing jealousy around could could be your greatest resource for actually getting the thing that you want, right? Like if I if I was more aware back then, I would have been like, oh, I could have befriended somebody who was uh who had the lifestyle that I was looking for and probably have learned a lot from them and maybe even could have helped each other or something. But instead, we just kind of like shut off the feeling, shut off the co- the connection, you know, and um we don't want to deal with it. So I think it's just interesting how um I don't know, like that that icky feeling can kind of just make us stop. I don't know, just be inactive, right? Instead of saying, okay, how could I how could I use this to my to my benefit? What could I learn about myself? Um, do you have any do you have any favorite tips or exercises or like mindset shifts? Let's say that somebody is really working on their jealousy, um, their feelings of jealousy. Maybe they're in therapy, maybe they've already recognized some things, maybe they're taking action, but they still are, you know, they're feeling heavy around this. So a few things come to mind, you know, I think this one is very commonly suggested, um, but journaling, and I don't mean like dear diary, like, you know, <laughs> sure. Well, cause people can kind of cringe when they hear that. And right. Right. I think, you know, just dumping everything on paper, no one is going to read it. You can try it after, but the idea is like, get that part of you. We all have different aspects, you know, of ourselves, different parts. And you might've heard of like parts work. Um, there is a part of you, you know, that is jealous right now and is focusing on all the negative things and how they don't like this person and whatever, right? That part also needs to be heard, right? So can you allow all that stuff, all those icky feelings that you're trying to shut down out, right? And that could be, you know, talking with a therapist, but it can also be dumping everything on paper in a journal, right? Just to lay it all out um, because then it, when that part quiets a bit and feels heard, then you can ask yourself all these questions. Okay, what is my need? What do I really want? What does that part need to feel a little better, right? Uh, oh, it needs more support. It needs some guidance of how to get there, right? Um, it, it would like to be friends with this person, but it's scared of rejection. Okay, how do we get there? So by kind of doing that work and putting everything on paper, you're getting, you're getting, the way I explain this is like, you're clearing out the junk in the room right. so you can clearly see, right? If, if you walk into a room and there's like boxes everywhere, right? And you don't know where everything is. You just moved maybe. You need to put everything on pack, clear it out so you can see the floor, you can see the ceiling, you can see the windows, right? Mm-hmm. So similarly, it's like, let's just dump everything out so then you can see what is my need here? What am I trying to do? Right. Oftentimes we get really lost in that chaos, right? We just get really stuck about the things that we don't like about that person or what they're doing. And it's just like a spiral and we just sit there and sit there and sit there, you know, um, instead of kind of coming out of it. And that can last for months, years, right? So, and you might need to like journal daily for a long time. It's not like a one-time thing, right? Every time that part of you comes up and has something to say, can we compassionately allow some space for that part to be heard. Um, the other thing you can do is um, go on a run or a walk. You know, um, if you're not a runner like me, you can just go on a fast paced walk and, and think about all of that because um, with walking, you know, you usually put one foot then the other, same with running, right? Unless you're jumping. So with the alternating feet, um, that helps us with the processing of the information. It It's similar to, EMDR therapy, actually EMDR therapy was developed while on the walk, the person who came up. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. The idea is that when you're thinking about something and there's some kind of bilateral stimulation, whether it's walking, right? You're moving alternative movements or like sounds that are alternating and I'm just tapping right on my table. I don't know if you guys can hear it, but um, those kind of sounds or any kind of tapping back and forth. But the walking is the easiest because you can just out on the walk right and think about what's bothering you while you're walking and that helps process things a bit so that you're not as activated right it won't solve all your problems you know but that that set activation feeling of jealousy will subside right I love that you can think clearly about the next steps 
I love this. I've never heard that before. I mean, I've obviously heard like go for a walk to clear your head and stuff, but I haven't heard like go for a walk and intentionally think about the thing that's bothering you to help you process that. So let's say, because I, I definitely want to try this next time. Uh, next time, do it in a safe space. Like, don't cross <laughs> streets when you're doing that. Don't go where there's traffic. <laughs> it's park or somewhere. Yes, I love it. I love it. So let's say that I wanted to try this for myself. Um, what am I kind of keeping in my head? Am I just thinking about, am I thinking about uh, my feelings? Am I, am I trying to come up with solutions for anything? What, how would you recommend somebody process something like that while doing a walk? So usually your brain does all the processing for you. You don't have to like purposely guide it anywhere. But yeah. what I would suggest is just think about what is the worst part of this for me? Mm. I don't know, like this thing, whole thing bothers me. What's the worst part? And usually they will have some kind of belief, some kind of image even in their mind, right? Um, and that's what you focus on. And then from there, as you're walking, your mind will wander and go to all sorts of different places. You know, you might yeah. remember situations that felt similar from your childhood. It may think of solutions organically. It may just vent and feel better, right? But don't try to uh, control it after that, like where it goes. Wherever it goes, it's fine. It needs to go there. I love that. It's so good. If you have a difficult feeling come up for you, or maybe it's a feeling of jealousy or something like that, what kind of things do you do for yourself that has has been the most helpful? Yeah. Um, so everything I suggested here, I've done, you know, myself as well. I've had my own EMDR therapy as well. I've had my own therapy. Um, and I think, you know, self-compassion is the part that regardless if you're a therapist or how many years you've been, I've, I've been doing this for close to 20 years. And yet it's something that we constantly have to remind ourselves to be self-compassionate because it's so easy to go to that place of, ah, why am I feeling this way? Yeah. Like, like I should know better. Or like, I don't have time to deal with this right now. Right. Um, and so just that compassion, that permission to be human and to experience this and go, okay, slow down. This is fine right? Like, this is okay. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, whether it's journaling, talking to a friend, doing therapy, going on a walk, anything also um, that uh, wakes our senses up, like if you take a bath or a shower, just something that's um, really soothing for you. And, and the answers can vary per person too, right? Um, I know I, I just tend to like really feel very calm in the shower, like, okay, it's my time, you know, just kind of allowing things to be uh, meditation, um, going on the walk, um, cooking something. I tend to cook lately. It's a newer thing that I will just cook and allow like my mind is just like go where it needs to go. And then it's kind of a soothing thing because I'm almost moving at the same time. But you will, each person will find what fits for them. You know, I think, the most important piece of that self-compassion. Like don't judge yourself for experiencing whatever it is that you're experiencing. It's there for a reason. It's a normal human experience. And the way to go through it is to go through it, not to like cut off and not try to feel those feelings, right? Right. Or find shortcuts. So allow you to experience that too. Right. And it's so easy to cut it off. I mean, sometimes that's like, oh, I just, I don't want to feel any of this. How can I avoid it? But yeah, it is just so important to let yourself feel it and process it and all of that. Um, but man, it is it is tempting just to shut it off and, you know, numb out and do whatever. Um, you mentioned parts work. Could you explain that a little bit more? And what is it? How does it work? Who can yeah, benefit yeah. from it? Um, anybody could benefit from it uh, because we all have it. Um, have the different parts is what I mean. Um, so... Parts work, um, you might have heard of things like inner child, your inner child, yes. or um, the IFS, internal family systems, um, yes. um, parts work. Um, so pretty much all of us, right, um, have had different experiences throughout our lives. And um, they have shaped us to who we are now, right? Obviously, genetics also plays a role, but experiences are huge like a child who's just born doesn't come with all this stuff limiting beliefs or preferences or um, fears and things like that um, and 
what happens is that we all have different aspects, different parts of ourselves. It could be a younger self. It could be, um, you know, how you show up in your work, in your career, where you maybe you're very confident versus how you show up in your romantic relationships where you might be feeling more insecure, right? That's a big one that I see. Like we have maybe, um, I'll have people who are so uh, advanced in their careers and have difficult jobs and just are such amazing leaders. And yet in their personal lives, they're struggling so much. And it's almost like a different person who is navigating those relationships. They're fearful of abandonment and, you know, things like that. And it's because they're all different parts. They're all different aspects of you based on your experiences that you've had, right? So if someone is interested in parts work, they can do therapy that's you know, specifically for that. But the idea is that no parts are um, there to harm you or no parts are bad, right? Um, they're there for a reason. They're all trying to keep you safe. That's their main right. goal. And with with the self compassion, this idea of let me allow each each part of mine to speak and to share what they need, uh, you create more of a harmonious place where all those parts can coexist, right? Um, so one example could be, um, you know, even with situations such as um, addiction, right, or uh, people pleasing, let's say, right. At one point, you, those things helped. That's why you were doing them, right. right? People pleased and you realized people were happy with you and there was no conflict. Okay, my system feels good, mm -hmm. right? Um, you had that drink and your anxiety went down a little and you felt more connected to people. Great, it helped in that moment, right? Mm -hmm. And then it stops helping at, after a certain time, right? Um, so you that part of you would be one part for example that would be what part of you is people pleasing what is it trying to protect you from what part of you is um turning to alcohol what is it trying to protect you from well it's trying to protect me from feeling the anxiety because it's unbearable or it's trying to protect me from being um abandoned and rejected by somebody else mm -hmm. what does it mean right and so you kind of do that work and I'm overly simplifying this whole process but um to allow each part to have their voice to, to find out what they fear what they need uh, because they're all there to protect you they all want you to feel safe to be good and sometimes they're in conflict because what your inner child might want might not be what your adult self thinks should happen Oh, right. interesting. Yeah. Uh, could right. could you share some examples around that where maybe the inner child and your adult self is not <laughs> matching up? Yeah. I mean, we're talking about jealousy, right? So let's think of an example where let's say you're in a relationship and you are um, threatened that this other person might take your partner away, right? And so you might have experienced that as a child where you didn't get enough attention, affection, and the um, love that you received was um, unstable, meaning that sometimes maybe your, your parent was very attentive and loving, and sometimes they would withdraw when they were stressed, and they were unavailable. And then you as a child, like, what happened? Like, I want consistency, right? Mm -hmm. uh, where's, where did my mom go or my dad go, right? Um, and again, none of this is like, no child sits there and thinks about it, but it's a need we have. So it's like, all of a sudden, I'm getting the silent treatment or they're locked in their room because they're depressed and I, you know, want to play with them, but then they come out and they play with me and I just don't know what to expect. Right. So it gives me this internal anxiety. So let's say that that's the person's past. Right. And now they're in a relationship where they are feeling threatened that this other person might take their partner away. Um, so they might turn to the same coping method they used as a child which was, I'm going to go people please and dance and sing for mommy and clean the whole kitchen so I can be a good girl and, you know, see, give me attention because then mom comes and gives me a hug, right? And now in this relationship, I might go out of my way to please them and to abandon my own needs and not even think about how I feel, but maybe I'll cook them dinner. Maybe I'll dress sexy for them. Maybe I'll just do whatever they want. I'll beg them to stay and be with me so that they don't leave right? It's the same kind of people pleasing method. Maybe it looks different, you know, but it's the right, same. Right. Uh, and maybe, so that's maybe one part, right? That's the inner child usually. 
Um, and then maybe you have this other part. Let's say you are, I don't know, um, you are this uh, amazing career-oriented woman who has a company of, I don't know, 5,000 people and you manage all that and you're the boss. So that part just comes in, takes control and gets everything situated. And that part is like, what are you doing? Why are you begging him to stay? Why are you dressing up in this outfit? Why are you cooking for him? You, you know, like you shouldn't do that. So that's the internal dialogue in some with someone like that, right? Like they has, have conflict. On one hand, they want to keep this person. They find themselves um, getting upset, like, oh, it's been two hours they haven't texted me what's going on like I'm should I cook them dinner should I try this should I just call and pretend like I forgot something so I can just hear their voice right that's the younger self right. and then let's say they do that then that part comes up and goes you're so stupid why did you do that that's so pathetic right this all this negative talk of like why are you doing that like you you're this like amazing person you shouldn't be so there's this back and forth right it feels like like what should I do right um but when you look at it right both parts are there to protect this this boss version of us right is trying to has gotten us to the successful place right by being disciplined and taking charge and doing all of this because yeah. that a part of also has brilliantly um used some coping methods to bring mom's attention back that worked at one point so it's utilizing what they know, you see. So we can have different parts. It's not just one or two. Right. Um, you know, with some some individuals who have um, more trauma that you know than the average person, um, that can turn into kind of sub personalities. You know, it used to be called multiple personality disorder. Uh, it's called DID now, mm-hmm. um, but that's kind of the the not extreme but this other end of the spectrum version of what all of us have these different parts right right so uh, even in the did treatment we're finding out now that it's not this like crazy thing like you have different personalities right like actually all of us have it it's just a matter of how individuated they are and how much they take charge right but we all have different voices in our heads telling us what we should do and and all of that. So it's fascinating. Um, again, I'm oversimplifying trying to like get the yeah, yeah. this out there, but yeah. No, it's yeah. interesting. So like, let's say that somebody is like, how do we integrate the inner child and what we need as an adult? Because let's say that for the example you brought up, somebody is aware, like, okay, I I'm aware that I'm slipping into my people pleasing tendencies with this person. I want to cook and clean and put some sexy on for them and all this stuff to, to, uh, keep them around. So they don't leave me. I recognize that that's what I want to do or have been doing, but what do I actually need to do to take care of the current version of me? Who's now an adult how do you, how do you like rectify that? You know, is there, is there a balance of like, here's how I take care of my inner child in this situation. Here's here. I, t- how I take care of adult me, like what, what should somebody be doing in that situation instead yeah. of slipping into old people pleasing? Yeah. I think just, you know, part of the work in therapy is really to hear each part and give them what they need as much as possible. So we're not ignoring one part and favoring another. Yeah. Right. It's not that um your inner child is wrong because they're young and they didn't know any better and your adult self is it, you know, is is better. Mm-hmm. Um both of them are trying to keep you safe and both of them are trying, right? And something is not working. So what is it that where is their pain for yeah. each part and what do they need each? Um and I and can they get along? Because the idea is that hey you're not alone in figuring this out in your child, right? Right. Hey, adult me, you're also not the only one in charge of figuring this out, right? We can all sort of, I can witness all the different parts of me Mm -hmm. um, and I can experience them and give them what they need. And then from this place of um, inner wisdom, inner calm, um, I can make like the wise decision of what to do next. Gotcha. Right? Mm-hmm. But it's not so much like you're right, you're wrong. I'm going to listen to you in this situation, but not to you. Right. Because right. it doesn't work. Like they will just speak louder. 
right? <laughs> yes, yes, totally. So it's kind of like, how can I tend to my inner child in this way? And also maybe my current self in this way. And what is harmonious about that, right? Maybe it's not too much of one or the other, like, you know, maybe my, my inner child, um, does want to cook that nice dinner, um, you know, maybe for my partner, but also for me. And then also here, maybe adult me wants to have a conversation with them when they get home, instead of putting on a sexy outfit, even when I don't want to, like, is that kind of what we have to try to yeah, yeah, you unravel? The process is so beautiful because it, it happens organically, right? Yeah. Like we don't have a therapist an agenda of how it should be necessarily, right? Because right. you will tell me what your inner child needs and what the best decision for you is, right? Yeah. Um, I'm just here to guide you through the process and give you all the tools so that all aspects of you, all parts of you feel heard, understood, and... Um, and that they they can think clearly. It's that example of the room that I brought up, like it's boxes and clutter, right? You can't yeah. see clearly when it's all cluttered, right? But once it's clean, then you can go, okay, so I think this feels right to me. Right. Yeah. Right. Yes. Right? And there's different ways you can like declutter, right? It, it, therapy is a really great way, but some people, you know, don't go to therapy or don't want to, or don't have, can't afford therapy or whatnot, Right. Um, but that's when there's other ways come in journaling, talking to a trusted friend, having a community, uh, going on those walks, um, anything else, spirituality, you know, things like that, that can really help uh, center you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are there any examples from maybe clients that you've had where maybe there was some kind of element of jealousy happening in the relationship, whether it was a romantic or familial relationship or anything like that? Um what uh what were they experiencing what helped them anything like that that you could share of like maybe more real life e examples so one example you know I work with a lot of um couples and individuals who work on their relationship uh concerns and oftentimes you know we have a hard time um being vulnerable you know Brene Brown talks about vulnerability so that's one good resource if um our listeners want to learn more about that um and so uh, let's say partner A is feeling jealous because um, partner B is not paying as much attention to them mm -hmm. and they're noticing this distance um, and um, wanting that closeness. And But instead of going and saying, hey, I really miss us, I really want to spend time with you, um, I'm having like scary thoughts that you may not like me, that's not normally what we go to. This partner A might turn to criticism and blaming and maybe even um, trying to find if they are being unfaithful or lying somehow. And so that is what person B is receiving, right? Like you're snooping on my phone, you're picking fights with me um, and that doesn't feel good. They're not gonna respond well to that. And so that creates conflict, creates more distance, right? Um, so what has helped, and I've seen this over and over again, is for partner A to become aware of what's happening. Okay, like these are the tip of the iceberg behaviors, right? Of like, I'm criticizing my partner. I'm trying to check their phone, their social media. I think something is happening. Um, they're not giving me a lot of attention. But what's actually happening is like, I am really threatened that I'm going to miss and somehow lose the person I love. Mm -hmm. So what is it that I need? Well, I need reassurance that this person is still here and nothing is happening. Um, okay, so what's the best way to go about it, right? And if they're able to come up with what and how they will say it, and this is you know tough for most people, like how can you communicate a vulnerability without being scared they're going to laugh at you or they're going to judge you or it's going to turn into a fight, right? So it's a process, but... If they're able to go and um, be vulnerable with their partners and say, hey, you know, I love you. I really care about you. I've been thinking about this and I really want to share this with you. Lately, I've been feeling very disconnected from you. And the story I'm telling myself is that you're distant and maybe you're not into me anymore and you don't care about me. And, and every time I see you, I don't know, text messaging, 
you know, your friends or so-and-so, I tell myself that you like them more than me or that you might have an affair and it really scares me. And so I want to ask you, is there anything like that happening? How do you feel about us? And usually the partner, you know, um, assuming nothing bad is happening, right? You go, well, I had no idea you were feeling that way. Like, no, honey, I am not feeling any of this. Like, do you want to see my phone? Do you want to come to our lunch next time? I'll invite you, right? Do you, like, where is this coming from? Oh, well, I had experiences in the past of this happened and the situation felt similar. So I just I'm freaking out. No, you know, I will try to make more time for us. Like, I don't want you feeling this way. And that's such a beautiful process that I've seen happen over and over again when people are able to, A, find out what is that I actually need? What is it? What do I want, right? What's underneath all that clutter? And B, ask for it in a vulnerable place that's not pushing my partner away, but inviting them in, right? Uh, Like, tell me the truth. Is there anything happening, right? Right. Uh, that the other example is, you know, with situations where um, something is happening that's crossing their boundaries, right? And just kind of doesn't sit well with them. It's an unhealthy kind of situation. Um, again, to slow down, what is it that I need? You know, um, can I ask? Maybe the ask doesn't go well usually because the person will gaslight them or lie to them more and, and make excuses, right? Or blame them like, oh, you're just, don't bring up your stuff. You're just the jealous type and things like that. Mm-hmm. And then they can just work on, you know, what do I, okay, I need to set boundaries here, right? With some consequences. So like, hey, I'm not comfortable with this. If I if that happens again, I can't be in this relationship. And I've seen them leave, you know, after that. And yeah. and it's a difficult process. It's painful, but it's also painful to stay in relationships that don't treat you well. Right. right? So right. like which pain are you willing to experience? Right. The yeah. one that's long term, like you're in a bad relationship, or that painful, painful process of ending the relationship and then being alone. And then finding yourself and hopefully then going out there and meeting other people. And that's also a beautiful process because then they're like, okay, now I'm able to kind of see that I wasn't crazy. I wasn't making this stuff up, right? And my needs matter. Yeah. And how can I heal parts of me that believe that I'm supposed to people, please, or, you know, all of those things. Um, and then it's almost like this authentic journey they get on after that where pain kind of throws them there first they don't want to go there but now that they're there they just embrace it and um start that healing journey and the next thing you know they're like I'm actually realizing I like to do this and like how did I ever settle for that and I can be vulnerable and I can still set boundaries I can be vulnerable and I can still you know ask for what I need you know, and expect people to give that to me, you know. Um, so, yeah, I think those two examples is what I would, you know, uh, explain when it comes to that. Yes, it's it's amazing how, um, like, narcissistic relationships aside, of course, sometimes there's not that reciprocity, but yeah. it's amazing how, like, how one conversation can just change everything if we have the courage to communicate it and bring it up instead of avoiding it, instead of avoiding the issue and the feelings, we, we kind of go towards it and connect with it. I know that um, a couple of friends of mine had experienced some kind of jealousy um, around each other for a little while. And they had one conversation. It totally it healed things. They got, they, it strengthened their relationship. They got stronger. They found out that they each felt jealous of each other about different things. And And that was it. But if they hadn't had that conversation, that could have led to months or years of discomfort or disconnection between them. And it's amazing what the outcome can be when we just have the courage to express ourselves, express our needs and, and see what happens. So I think it's great that sometimes it can be as simple as that. And, but, but it feels so hard for us to do it. It is hard. It is hard. It's simple, but it's hard because, you know, um, we there's a fear of rejection there's a fear of you know i'm gonna open my heart to you and you may not right so right it's right a courageous thing to do to choose to um speak directly about your needs and wants um and be vulnerable right, right. 
that's a hard thing. A lot of people weren't born in families that encouraged that. Yeah. Direct, yeah. horrible, honest communication. Absolutely. What about the person who did have, let's say that somebody had the courage, they finally spoke up and, and expressed what, the, what was going on for them, this feeling of maybe jealousy, and it wasn't received well. Do you have any advice for that person who's feeling like, oh, I shouldn't have said anything. I should have just kept it to myself. What about that person? Well, I think it's, first of all, like, you know, to that person, I think it's so courageous that you did that, right? And it also is, regardless of how that person responds, it's so healing for you. You may not see that in the moment, but I spoke up for myself. I honored my own needs. I gave that part of me a voice to speak up and that's huge. So I think just to like pause and take that in as well. Like, even if they don't take it well, like I did my part, I was honest. I was authentic to myself. I didn't play games. I didn't manipulate. I didn't control. I didn't avoid. I didn't hold things in. Right. Yeah. The response, you know, I would just kind of, um, can, why they respond badly can have different reasons, right? Like, are they gaslighting you and it's a relationship where you actually need to leave, you know, or did the way you uh, um, express your needs come off as criticism instead of just, Mm. are you vulnerable? Because sometimes people think they're vulnerable and they're not. Mm. You see what I mean? Oh yeah, interesting. Yeah. Like I I think I'm being like um, gentle in my communication, but I'm not. Like I might say something, you know, and then, then you're all the time, you're just like spending with your friends. So how am I supposed to feel like, do you even care about me? Like that's already right. Like, um, an accusation, like you don't care about me right. and I'm already criticizing you for spending time with your friends when we all want to spend time with our friends. Right. So they will get defensive. So maybe their response, like, what are you talking about? Right. Yeah. That's your, it's a defensiveness versus like, they didn't hear you. So that's how I'm saying so important to get as vulnerable as you can, you know, and talk about your feelings, what you need, not really describing your partner or, you know, uh, labeling them in any negative way. Um, and you, you'll you know, if you use sentences with you, you always, you never, you should, that's already criticism. You're already going in there, you know, so it's important to stay with I feelings. I feel sad when I see you you know, texting your friends because what I want is to spend time with you, right? That, that's going to be received differently than you're always on your phone and you don't pay attention to me because maybe they're not not trying not to pay attention to you, but they're just thinking you're fine and they just want to connect you with their friends and that's fine as well, right? So, so, the, so I would say like, if it's not received well, is it because the communication wasn't as gentle and soft, you know, and they got defensive because they felt somehow attacked or is it that they're just gaslighting you, right? That there's a pattern of them not taking any responsibility for anything that they do. Um, you know, so that would, depending on which one it is, I would have different recommendations. Yes. Oh gosh, that's such a good point that somebody might think that I did bring it up. I was vulnerable. I did express this, the my needs, but they may have done it the way that you kind of mentioned. Maybe it was a little bit more accusatory. It, it yeah. wasn't received well, but that is really interesting. I bet I would imagine that um, uh, couples, you know, maybe come to you or they come into therapy and you know, one person might say like, oh, I've said this a million times. And the other person's like, I've never heard this before because maybe they're saying it differently when they're actually in therapy. <laughs> they're getting to the root. <laughs> and and it's, it's kind of like funny too, you know, because we'll it's like, stay with your feelings. I feel blank. What's your emotion? I feel, right. don't accuse them. Don't name call them. Like, you know, I f- you're an idiot. Mm-mm, we're not saying that, right? right? Okay, I feel I feel like you're an idiot. That's what we're saying. <laughs> <thing. laughs> You can't I feel like an idiot. It's going to be the new t-shirt that we make. <laughs> I feel like you're an idiot. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's a process, you know, yes. but most of us aren't born knowing how to communicate this thing. So right. um, obviously self-compassion, as I mentioned before, be gentle with yourself as you're trying to navigate all this. Oh yeah. So good. Anna, thank you so much for being here today. Is there anything else that we didn't mention that you feel like is really important for people to know about the topic of jealousy or, you know, anything else that you want to share? Oh, let me see. Um, 
No, you know, I, I think, you know, reading uh, some of Brene Brown's work, since I mentioned she came up with the vulnerability, we mentioned that it would be yes. really helpful because I know she talks a lot about just normalizing emotions, different feelings we have. Yeah. So I think that one resource, just want to add, if someone wants to go deeper into understanding what they're feeling, how it's all normal and, you know, how it's okay to be vulnerable. Um, yeah, I think it's um, just, you know, in self-compassion. I think yeah. it's like, we're all human. We have different emotions. So just, it's okay to just be and have flaws and make mistakes and fall and get up again and, um, and feel jealous. Right. It's okay. Yes. I love mm -hmm. it. Okay. I have one more question. Cause I forgot. This is what I was going to ask you earlier. Do you think that these other systems that we have to navigate, like, you know, capitalism or, you know, anything else, do you think those have a role around our feelings of jealousy? Like if we weren't kind of raised into this like kind of competitive environment and, you know, these feelings of scarcity were, were kind of thrown at, thrown at us quite a bit. Do you think that as much jealousy would come up as it does? Or do you think if people felt like I'm safe, I'm secure, there's plenty of resources for me, I'm, I'm okay. Do you think we would be experiencing as much jealousy as we do? I love that question. Yeah, you know, there is your own to something there because the truth is that people don't get the same opportunities, right? right? Like, um, and if you, for example, if you have um, finances, right, then you can afford more. You can afford regardless of, you know whether it's um your personal life um I don't know your how you look right how you take care of yourself with food workouts yeah dress all of that right um or if you don't that's gonna make you feel different right and and it's not a situation of um let me work on myself and still it's a situational thing it's your your um environment the society right? Um, you're going to have more resources for your career as well. You're going to know and have more connections. Um, you're going to be able to um, be better at, I don't know, sales and marketing and all these other things, right? Where someone in the background might not have that opportunity and those connections. So yeah, I think that creates that comparison, right? right? And so um yeah, I think if we if our society was a bit different where people had equal opportunities for um achieving their authentic self and for succeeding, yeah. uh, then maybe it would be less competitive and um you know more inclusive of like there is room for everybody to succeed. There is room for people just to be um you know, but I think I, I feel like the world is kind of not like that anymore, you know, even with like we're progressing in on one hand, right? Like look at how far the technology has progressed since even like our childhoods, right? Um, right, right. But there's also harm in there. Like look at all the social media and the comparisons that it just brings up in you naturally by like you're looking at all this, you need to have this product. And you need to be like this person. You need to look like them. You need to be successful like them, right? And there's a lot yes. of complaints where you don't know, well, what are the resources of that person? How privileged are they? And, um, you know, so yeah, I think there is there is a lot of truth in what you're saying. Thank you so much for being here. And where can people find you, your work, all that good stuff? How, how can they work with you? Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me. Really enjoyed our conversation. Same here. Uh, so they can find me on our website. Um, it's me and I have a really good set of um, therapists and a coach who work with clients uh, individually and as couples. Um, uh, my website is www.mytherapycorner.com. It's my therapy corner, all one word. Um, they can also find me on Instagram at mytherapycorner. Uh, we do post a lot of helpful tips and suggestions and resources for similar topics. Um, you know, and, and if they need to contact us, they can contact us from the website uh, by just emailing us um, and signing up for our newsletter. We do have uh, workshops, webinars periodically. We provide therapy and coaching services. So depending on what they're interested in. 
Beautiful. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I hope you have a great rest of your day. You have a wonderful weekend. Thank you to Anna for being on the podcast today. I really, uh, this concept of trying to figure out, you know, has somebody crossed a boundary of yours and that's why you're feeling this way? Is it, or is it, you know, unprocessed or unresolved trauma and that's why you're feeling this jealousy coming up? Or maybe it's a mix of both and just trying to, you know, sift through and figure out where this feeling is coming from. And a big um, pattern in today's conversation that Anna mentioned a few times is self-compassion and not to be, you know, don't be unkind to yourself for feeling this emotion. And our emotions are just trying to protect us. Um, a couple other things that I uh, forgot to mention, this can be my, my hot tips of the episode, is I also like to um, remember that if you're feeling jealous, let's say that you're feeling jealous of somebody, it, sometimes it's just easier to remember that um, they also feel jealous of other people. <laughs> you know, we're all human and they might even feel jealous of you for some reason. You might feel jealous about each other um, for, you know, in, in different ways. So I don't know, that, that can kind of take things, I feel like neutralize things a little bit too. And then I heard this great tip um, when I was re reading a little bit about jealousy. Somebody said, you know, the next time you feel jealous of somebody, take an action um like sending them a nice message or even giving them a gift maybe so maybe it's writing a nice text to them or whatever an instagram message telling you know complimenting them or 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 actually give them a gift of some kind and see how that feels um and if that can kind of ease some of the the jealous feelings as well i thought that was an interesting tip i definitely want to try that the next time I feel this emotion come up for me as well. Okay, so one of our patrons submitted a quote and the quote is actually from their dad. So it says, true intelligence means to adapt and adjust to your surroundings. An intelligent person makes the best of what they already have or know. Education is simply a privilege one has. And that quote is from uh, Santos Cruz Hernandez. What this, I, I loved this so much. First of all, that, you're quoting your dad is so it's so sweet and it's so true and thank you so much for sending the background uh of this quote as well so um the pa our patron goes by uh, archangel is their username so they were talking they they mentioned that the background of this quote is they grew up really struggling in school and by the time they were like seven years old just having all these awful messages already thrown at them of like, you're dumb. Why can't you figure this out? This is supposed to be easy. All these just terrible messages. Um, and not finding out until in their 20s or so that they had some disorders that were maybe contributing to some of the learning challenges that they were experiencing. And their dad, who has no formal education, is this really brilliant roofer and can build houses and all these really different cool roofs, 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 um, and that, you know, he needs to understand all these different, like, calculus equations and stuff to um, build these really immaculate roofs. And um, our patron was about to go off for college and asked asked uh, their dad, you know, how do you know all of this without, you know, going to school for these things and having all these like specialized classes? And they had this conversation about, you know, true intelligence and and that it's not just about the, the grades that you get in school. You know, that might be one kind of uh, intelligence and, um, you know, it, it's not everything. Thank you so much for taking the time to really pour your heart out on where this quote comes from and what it means to you. And also, I heard it's your birthday. So happy birthday. I hope it was a lovely one. And just, yeah, thank you so much to Santos and Archangel for writing this in. All right. And we are wrapping up with the iTunes review of the episode. This is from ABC Nick. And it says, a breath of fresh air. I love this podcast. I like self-help. I like to laugh. This is great. Keep it up. Thanks. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Short and sweet to the point. Fantastic. Really appreciate you taking the time. Feel free to leave a, an iTunes review uh, or Apple. Po I guess it's not even iTunes anymore, right? It's Apple Podcasts. I'm so sorry. Apple Podcasts. Go to your app 
you know, click the stars, you can write something. And we, you know, we're pretty much all caught up with reviews. So your your review will get seen and, and read on the next episode and really, really appreciate it so much. All right, everybody, I hope you have a great week and I will talk to you soon. Maybe I'm Thank you for tuning in to the Self Helpless Podcast. You can find our Patreon community, merch, and other goodies at selfhelplesspodcast.com. We'd be thrilled if you left an iTunes review, shared this episode with a friend, or post about it on Instagram and tag at selfhelplesspodcast so we can repost you and say hi. Thanks, everyone.